Shell Petroleum Nigeria Development Company has agreed to settle uh, in, uh, with the uh, local community of the Ogoni people to the tune of $110 million to settle a case over, of course, oil spill that occurred decades ago. Uh, the Royal Dutch Cell Nigeria's unit, which has agreed to pay the Ejama Ebubu community, approached a court in Abuja, Nigeria's capital, on Wednesday to disclose the uh, development. According to the community's lawyer, Lucius Nwosu, Shell approached the court in Abuja and has agreed to pay that sum within 21 days. Uh, the payment is for full and final satisfaction of the court judge issued against the company uh, years ago. All right, we're going to speak with uh, Mustafa Wahab, who is an oil and gas analyst with Chapel Hill Denim further. Uh, Mustafa, uh, what took so long uh, to get here with, with Shell? Uh, um, I think this is a very important question, right? I think this case is a, a case that is dated far, um, anywhere between 67 and 70, mm. a year that sort of coincided with the civil um, war in Nigeria, right? I think in, in Shell's defense, um, what they were basically stating was that, look, um, we only own 45% of the OML 11 that's, that is situated on um, Ogoni, Ogoni um, community, right? So the key question then becomes, why are we the only one, you know, uh, being liable for these all losses? And secondly, for Shell, really, is that um, uh, they, they, they clearly said that they've not, um, FGN, I mean, the court has not given them the opportunity to uh, basically, you know, speak for themselves, right? And what they were act actually arguing for was that between those period, um, some of these spillages that, you know, that warrants this or court judgment was basically caused by a third party, not necessarily because of them. Now, after facing a series of, you know, um, um, courts, you know, um, rules and, and, and um, rejection from, from the shell side of things, it just basically become, you know, imperative for them to just, you know, quickly settle the case and then move on to, to, to the make next big thing as far as the company strategy is concerned. Mm. And um, can we, speaking of uh, company strategy, can we link this to the recent decision, which was what, I mean, when they announced it two, three weeks ago, yeah. I think we had you even yeah, talk yeah. about that, to divest from their onshore and shallow water assets. Any, uh, can you draw a link? So, I mean, I think in the, um, from hindsight, yes, we can link it, but in the grand scheme of things, maybe not necessarily, right? I mean, I think at some point, Shell's MD basically called, you know, Nigeria shallow water block assets a headache. And that's basically because of the fact that, you know, they've had to do with issues around oil bunkering, you know, um, oil spillage, you know, that is warranting different court cases in, 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 in the country. Hence, you know, the reason why, you know, management might think that maybe if we leave this sort of asset and move towards, you know, offshore assets where profitability is the highest, it just sort of makes sense. But in the grand scheme of things, I think um, high OCs generally are basically just, you know, re-strategizing how they operate in Africa. And Nigeria is no longer the, uh, the center or the core of their operation. Right? So what they are now doing is that, you know, they move from shallow water block towards, you know, offshore assets where they think, you know, they can, they can repeal um, 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 see, you know, better return on investment. But beyond that, they are also facing significant amount of pressure, you know, from funding communities globally. You know, a lot of, you know, um, um, funds, you know, are basically saying no to any exploration, you know, companies. And that's basically because of the environmental issues, you know, generally. Hence the reason why, you know, they feel like, you know, Nigeria is not becoming, you know, a, a, a core, core of their own operation and then, you know, moving towards, you know, cleaner and perhaps green energy. How do you think this decision, this, this, um, this is a lot of, it's $110 million, yeah. I mean, my goodness. Uh, how, how do you think other, the other players in the sector will view the, uh, the decision? Uh, so in, in our own opinion, generally, what we think is that uh, compared to 6770, today, you know, technology is, is a lot stronger in the, in the um, upstream, you know, oil and gas segment, you know, spillages are a lot lower. That does not necessarily move, remove the, you know, environmental impact of, you know, upstream activities, right? What we think is that, you know, other, other you know, oil uh, producing com companies, you know, are more, you know, are, are doing a lot more, you know, engagement with host companies. I, I mean, I suspect that's one of the reasons why a company like Seplat, you know, is very successful as far as, you know, operation in Nigeria is concerned. When you engage those communities and, you know, do some of the key uh, things that they're asking you to do, then you can then, you know, sit back and relax, you know, enjoy, you know, pro pro do doing your production and also, you know, um, carrying out your business activities without necessarily worrying about, you know, um, the host communities um, um, really. Um, speaking of the host communities, um, well, actually, environmentalists, will environmentalists be declaring victory um, <laughs> with, this, yeah. with this decision? I mean, absolutely. $100 million is, is a lot of money, right? Um, for a business, I mean, coughing out that amount of money is, is, is going to do a lot of damage, right? So uh, from that perspective, um, 
um, anybody you know operating in the upstream segment of Ni Nigeria or anywhere in the world sort of tend to start to think of other you know alternative energy which which is a lot more cleaner and, and, and obviously you know um, more friendly to environmentalists and, and whatnot so if these guys could win the case then it then means that other environmentalists across the globe can also push for the same agenda and obviously you know get get their their um, demands and to piggyback on that in terms of the ongoing uh, renewable energy, fossil fuel yeah. debates. I mean, where does this where, where does this fit in? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 now becoming a case where I mean, at some point, I was reading somewhere that um, this sort of oil price rally that we're seeing is probably the last of it that we'll, that we'll probably see, you know, um, um, in the global oil market, and that's basically because of the fact that you know um, renewables is now you know aggressively you know um, replacing you know traditional you know um, 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 fossil fuel. Um, energy. I mean, at some point in, in Europe, there are some countries who are saying that, look, between it, between now and the next 10 years, we want to stop any internal combustion, you know, engine um, kind of cars, you know, to run on their roads. So it then basically means that, you know, any any renewable energy companies and uh, or any renewable um, uh, or, or, or electricity cars would sort of start to, you know, uh, cannibalizing um, the uh, traditional internal combustion, you know, uh, cars in, in the world. So it, it then makes sense for us to start to think about how you know, we want to invest heavily in rene renewables rather than focusing strictly on oil. Mm. Okay, so obviously the community is going to be celebrating yeah. and, yeah. I, you know, if oil was spilled, you yeah. know, this is this is an outcome of all that. Yeah. Any drawbacks at all from this? Is, is the only drawback going to be on Shell side yeah. or, or if you take a macro view of everything? Yeah, I think it's just basically going to be on Shell side, right? Uh, I mean, 100 million, you know, coming out of your books is, is a lot, right? So why I think then it, it then becomes, you know, necessary for Shell to start to speed up their own divestment from any, you know, shallow water block, you know, assets in Nigeria, right? I think they've, they've already announced that they are doing a couple of a couple of you know divestments you know in the last couple of weeks right so they'll just sort of speed it up and then you know move on to um, um, a, a cleaner or, or, or green energy or, or whatever you so but okay so this is the Nigerian community that's obviously gotten this money uh, but for the nation as a whole you can is it is it black and white enough to say this is a win or loss or we're negatively or positively impacted by this or is it more nuanced and more complicated than that how uh, for nigeria as a whole how do you yeah i mean i think nigerian governments um would not be celebrating i mean we're talking about iocs people who bring huge amount of money into the country to invest heavily. i mean we're talking about you know the passage of pib and one of the key concerns of pib is basically how we want to start to see massive wave of investment coming into, into the country. I mean, if anybody, you know, who is planning to come to Nigeria, hear this sort of, you know, judgment, and Nigeria who, who owns about 55% of the assets, you know, are basically not doing anything to just, you know, limit the impact on Shell alone, then it then becomes a lot of problem for them to, you know, start to think about um, if, if Nigeria is a place that they want to go to, right? So, um, in a way, for Nigeria generally, I don't, I don't, I don't see it as, as a positive news, uh, but for the people of Ogoni, ab absolutely. It's positive for them. Fantastic. I just want to take things a little bit more global. Earlier in this segment, we we're talking about Joe Biden and yeah. his national security advisor um, uh, trying to compel OPEC to um, increase production, uh, you know, because of what's going on there. I just want to get your take on what what you make of, of that and maybe the selfish interest in the United States yeah. or so on. But, but yeah, what do you make of that and how do you think OPEC would, 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 would react? This is not new. I mean, if you were paying attention two years ago or last mm. year, I think last year, I mean, Donald Trump was basically tweeting almost on a regular basis <laughs> about, for OPEC Plus right. you know, to basically push a lot more production into the market, right? Yeah. So what we are seeing right now is that between now and the next few months, right, some of the output increase that OPEC has announced, they are not enough to sort of, you know, cover for the deficit that we're going to be seeing in the, for the rest of the year, meaning that we'll likely see oil price remaining this elevated. And for a country like U.S., where, you know, the impact of... Um, crude oil prices is basically directly, you know, related to um, 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 petrol price in the country. And like Nigeria, we had a subsidy and we don't see the impact, mm. right? You start to see some sort of gasoline price increase, which is obviously going to be fueling, you know, inflation in the communities. Then that makes sense for Joe Biden to, to sort of ask, you know, OPEC to raise production. Uh, I mean, obviously, what, what he was saying when I read it this morning was that they should allow the market to dictate the price, not necessarily, you know, by... Uh, using their own um, OPEC, you know, out, out, output costs to dictate what is going to be produced um, globally. So they want price to be lower compared to what we're seeing today, such that they can see, you know, the direct impact on on gasoline price in the in the domestic, you know, uh, market in the U.S. Great. So so that's their position. But how do you think 
OPEC, I mean, my, our analyst earlier, Michael yeah. Wilson, was saying yeah. that, you know, OPEC probably might not uh, acquiesce <laughs> to that request. Well, <laughs> how do you think? How do you yeah, think? I mean, I completely agree. I think the strategy of the leader of OPEC today, a country like Saudi Arabia, is that they want to use proceeds from oil and gas, you know, between now and the next 10 years to basically fund, you know, or other segment of the, of the, of the, of the or other sector of the country. What, uh, I mean, the leaders of, of Saudi Arabia said at some point this year was that they want to become an energy company, a country such that 50% um, of the proceeds from, um, from 50% uh, of FGN revenue, uh, I mean, the government of Saudi Arabia's revenue is going to be coming from, you know, anything outside of oil. So what they are doing right now is that they need oil price to remain elevated such that they are able to fund, you know, the key infrastructure and also key, you know, um, key revenue generating units that is essentially going to be, you know, outside of oil. So it then makes sense for them to leave oil price at current levels, which it then means that the public would not, you know, listen to what the U.S. government is saying. I mean, from the market point of view, uh, politically, perhaps they could, but mm. fundamentally and market-wise, I think they still want oil price to remain elevated. I mean, the same cannot be said for Nigeria, but for a country like Saudi Arabia and Russia, oil price, higher oil price makes a lot, a lot of sense for them from, from fiscal perspective. Great stuff. Um, we, we've seen oil prices, things have been a bit volatile. Back on, you know, it was all red on Monday, then it was green Tuesday. Yesterday, was, that was up, up earlier, we were about a minute ago. How do you yeah. see... I guess prices you yeah, know, playing yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, we've time. seen correction this morning. Um, yesterday was basically because of the fact that you know China is now you know um, announcing another um, round of lockdown due to you know the increase in Delta variant of, of of coronavirus. Obviously, because of the fact that that would obviously affect you know um, crude oil demand from China, and obviously the impact is negative for for crude oil price. But today, we've seen oil price recover. I think Brent is currently at $71 per barrel this morning. And that's basically because of the fact that, you know, um, the market is still, market still understand that we are going to probably remain in the deficit terrain between now and the next, you know, uh, few, few months. What I said earlier is that um, output increase by OPEC is not enough to, to, to support or to supply, you know, some of the deficit that we're going to be seeing within, between now and the next few, few months. It then makes sense, you know, for oil price to recover and then for, for, for marketers to start to, you know, bet for higher oil price. And for us in Chapuy, we also think that, you know, price will remain elevated at this level. Mustafa Wahab, oil and gas analyst, Chapel Hill Denham. Thank you so much for talking to oil and gas with us. We appreciate it.